Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do this. Yay. Okay. Um, so one of the last things we talked about on Wednesday was rate of return, right? So we talked about the fact that when you're looking at the return on an asset, the numerator is all of the cash flows that you would get overall from um, this, you know, from owning an asset, right? So they were talking about this with respect to investments. So the two primary cash flows that you have would be any dividends that you would receive as well as the change in value. So they kind of, they didn't really show what goes into the sausage on the $600. We went through that on Wednesday, but essentially it's what you paid for something minus what you received for when you sold it at the end or what the change in, or what it's worth at the end if you sell it. That would be considered your rate of return for an investment asset. And that works with, if any of you are taking financial management, it's the same calculation. You'll learn that a little later in the semester in that class also. And then you divide it by what you were, all of those cash flows by what you originally paid for it to arrive at a percentage rate of return. Okay. Um, and then generally speaking, we also talked a little bit about risk, right? What uh, did we say the relationship was with um, risk and expected or desired returns? Yeah. The greater the risk, the greater expected returns. Yes, exactly. So typically you will see higher returns on things that are higher risk and you will see lower returns on things that are lower risk. We see that play out with respect to investments too. So like the very lowest risk investments generally are government backed securities, at least in the United States anyway, because the US government has so far, knock on wood, never defaulted on paying one of its debts. So like things like treasury bonds are deemed to be like guaranteed income. But the flip side of that is you get a very, very low return on those. Whereas things that uh, tend to be more speculative, more volatile and less predictable, you would generally expect a higher rate of return. Otherwise it's not worth it for you to even bet up, right? Um, I like to use an example on that one of like lending money to one of your friends, or would you, um, if you're gonna lend money to somebody, are you gonna lend it to the friend who you know, like reliably has a history of paying you back the next day, or the person who just seems to build up a perpetual pile of things that they never pay back, or maybe they take, maybe they do pay you back, but they pay you back like two weeks later, you'd be tempted to charge that person more of a fee, right? in order to make it worth your while. Like, dude, if I'm lending you $20 and you're not gonna give it back to me for two weeks, you're, you're gonna have to pay me back 25 at the end of it, right? That's the time value of money and also risk return, right? Okay, so uh, with that, just pulling this back, to, uh, take out a piece of paper or you could use Excel or whatever on a device if you want, you feel free to use a calculator. Let's figure out what the return would be for this particular um, question here, just quick example. There is something tricky. Make sure you read it and you don't just grab the thousand dollars out of there, by the way, which like I did, I, I speed read it. Classic mistake. All right, what everybody come up with? Five percent. Yeah, five percent, right? So 
Uh, we've got quarterly dividends. So four quarterly dividends of a thousand bucks times four is a thousand dollars. Let me just, I can scribble this out for anybody who, so we've got that times four plus the change in value, right? So 4,000 in dividends plus 206,000 minus 200,000. And then we're dividing all of that by the original 200,000, right? So make sure if you do things like abbreviating this too, that you don't forget where you're at with zero. So uh, so this one ends up being a $6,000 return, which you can kind of do in your head. So we've got 10,000 divided by 200,000, which means you can zap out the zeros, ending up with one divided by 20, which is 5%. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> All righty. Oh, and they gave it to us on the slide too. So you could be just following along in the slides and totally cheating on this, but you wouldn't learn, would you? Okay. So here they have an example of uncertainty. Like which one of these would you rather pick? Investing $10,000 in a savings account insured by the U.S. government. <laughs> that will generate a 5% rate of return, which makes me laugh because there's like not a savings account anywhere where you're gonna get 5%. Nobody would put their money anywhere else if you just put it there for 5%. Um, or investing $10,000 in a profit-oriented company. So, and what would what would cause you to make a different decision here potentially? Where? If investing in the property of the company was like way higher yield. Than yeah, you would, it, because the one, yay, it's not guaranteed, right? So it's a profit oriented company. Maybe it has a great history, but even if it's the most solid company that's been doing this forever, um, you kind of consider how new it was, right? So if it was say elite that had been paying a certain percentage per year for decades, you could look at it and say, well, what percentage has this been getting? How does that compare? Elite might be slightly more risky. If it's 5% or less for the profit-oriented company, there's no incentive to invest in that, right? Because you can either do zero risk with 5% or some unquantifiable risk here. But if there was like, say, 10% on the profit-oriented company, then you'd look at more factors, right? You'd want to consider, well, how much risk is there? I mean, is it relatively risk-free or is it slightly risky? Is it a lot of risk? Um, if you have a risk tolerance and you think that the return would be high enough where this fit within your risk uh, tolerance level, um, then you would probably go with the profit-oriented company. We don't always like go for zero risk. Um, sometimes we wanna go for a tolerable level of risk. Um, but again, if it was below that 5%, it wouldn't be an adequate rate of return for you to make that decision. All right, so the objective of financial accounting is that we're gonna be providing better information so that people can make that risk assessment accurately or more accurately, right? There's no such thing as perfectly accurate. Um, but we ultimately want the information to be of good enough quality that people can use it for decision-making it has to be helpful for investors and creditors to make these decisions. And um, we also have to get enough information, hopefully about their cash flows to look at these three aspects of their cash flows, right? So what are the amounts of their expected cash flows? When do they expect to receive those? And what is the degree of uncertainty surrounding those? Because that will affect the risk overall. So um, one of the key aspects of financial reporting that um, you have to kind of keep an eye on is cash flows as opposed to accrual-based accounting. So everybody hopefully got a good introduction to the differences between those two in your earlier courses. But again, since these first two chapters are kind of like summarizing a year worth of previous financial stuff in about two weeks, we'll just zip through this. Um, what is What are two big account classes that anyone can remember 
that are related to accrual accounting that you don't see in cash accounting. One of them is a liability. I'll give you a hint. One's a current liability and one of them is a current asset. Yeah. So revenue and expenses are actually income statement accounts. I'm looking at ones from the balance sheet. So think about like future inflows of assets that are owed to us or future obligations. Yes. Accounts payable and accounts receivable. Yeah. So accounts payable and accounts receivable are probably like the single biggest factor difference between cash and accrual accounting. Because sometimes we have a transaction where the cash doesn't change hands, but a contractual obligation has occurred, right? Um, so if I were to order a whole bunch of inventory for my company from a vendor and they send it to me, I now have that inventory, but I haven't given them any cash yet. If they don't record that sale, and I don't record that I've received that inventory, both of our financials are, are not accurate, right? Um, or if I record that um, inventory, what do I put on the other side of the entry if I don't record that I owe someone money and I haven't paid them cash, right? So that would be the difference between accrual accounting and cash accounting. Under cash accounting, I wouldn't even record that inventory until I paid for it. I just have it there and be like, yay, I'm having a party with my free inventory, um, which the vendor might not be super excited about. So with cash basis accounting, we only measure those cash receipts and cash payments as we actually exchange the cash. All right, so accounts receivable, accounts payable don't exist. Um, and that's kind of a problem, right? Because it doesn't actually reflect either the legal or the economic situation that we're in accurately. So knowing that it's not super accurate, why would we do cash basis accounting? Yeah. It's easier? Yeah, super easy because like, okay, I don't have to think about it until I write you out a check for it. And then I can just go through my checkbook and look at what my cash balance is and that's how much cash I actually have and et cetera. So, so it's easier, it's a little more intuitive for people who don't understand, but it doesn't necessarily uh, reflect that. So that's why we have that cash basis or that uh, statement of cash flows that we talked about on Wednesday, because it's helpful for us to understand both the full economic reality through accrual-based accounting, but it's also nice for us to know why is our cash going up or going down maybe if even though we have profit right and that cash uh statement of cash flows helps us sort of inter uh or uh, um, translate between the two okay so then um in cash basis accounting we we're what we're really calculating if we're just recording things when cash happens is our operating cash flow we aren't actually accurately capturing net income, right? Whereas accrual basis accounting more accurately reflects that economic net income or loss. All right, so this walks through a cash basis example here where um, we've got a company that paid $60,000 for three years rent at the beginning of year one. And then this kind of shows um, what their net operating cash flows would be under that situation. So cash basis only. They've got sales of $100,000 a year, $300,000 for the three years. They've got a variety of cash receipts from the customers, which may be for current sales, prior sales, whatever. We don't know and we don't care because it's cash basis. So we record it as a sale when they give us the cash, regardless of when we actually delivered something to them. Um, we reflect the full $60,000 year uh, worth of rent in this first year. And then we have salaries that are reflecting the same each year, utilities, um, which kind of fluctuate depending on what we're doing, right? So why is it a why is it problematic to expense all of that rent in the first year um, when we pay for it? Yeah. Uh, it shows a negative on your net operating cash flow, it'll be lower than your other year. Yeah, so it, it, it lumps all of those um, expenses together 
in a year when they aren't actually being used. So if we were gonna make a decision based on whether we should operate at all in year two and year three, we would be looking at it strictly based on like, quote unquote, losing $65,000 that first year. So what should our rent actually be under an accrual basis for that first year? 20, 20 right? So a third of it. So that's a $40,000 difference. We would still lose money that first year, but instead of losing $65,000, we would be losing $25,000. And then in year two, we'd be making $40,000. And in year three, we would be making $45,000 if we were to incorporate that in, which, um, which looks better. And and it more and in years two and three, it probably more accurate accurately reflects what we can plan on having for income in future years too, right? So if we were in year three and we were like, hey, we made sixty five thousand dollars, I bet we'll make sixty five thousand dollars again next year. That wouldn't really be true, right? Because if we're paying three years of rent at a time and we move out to year four, we're very likely to have another at least one year lease payment possibly another three-year lease payment, which would not be accurately uh, uh, portrayed by that $65,000 going forward. Because most of the decisions we make on what we think will happen in the future is, is gonna be the most recent past, typically, right? Okay, now in this accrual basis, this shows up what I was just talking about here. Um, Oh, here, hold on. Oh, so that's the other thing that we didn't discuss too, is that if we had um, $300,000 worth of income, but it came in this way because that's how we collected the money, that those cash receipts would uh, also, or the income would be reflected differently on those three years also. So I talked about the expense part, but not really the um, how the revenue would change. They actually had $100,000 worth of income each year so they had a very steady and predictable income level throughout those three years when you look at it that way. I have a question. Yep. So should every serious company that wants to be around more than a couple of years and wants to go start off using the accrual method? I mean, from a, it's better if you do, um, because you're going to have to probably end up making some of those calculations when you do your taxes anyway. So, I mean, and if you have to borrow money where you have to do financial statements for a bank or something like that, they're going to pretty much have to be on accrual basis. They might actually be on what's called tax basis, which is a modified basis. So... Um, if you were operating as like Schedule C as an individual, um, you could make a potential argument for a tax basis of cash because um, you don't have the money in yet and therefore shouldn't be taxed on it. But um, that's only available in certain, certain circumstances. So you, you create more work for yourself to convert it to uh, accrual basis later. At the very least, some type of um, modified accrual basis where you have payables and receivables and have your major liabilities and stuff on the books is what you should do. Just, I mean, because otherwise you're not even keeping track of what you owe people in your accounting system. And then you're having to do that manually outside of your accounting system. So it creates more potential for error and actually more work in the long run if you don't. Yeah. Um, like so with that cash example, wouldn't that like alarm your investors if they don't exactly know what's going on? Yes, yep. And and so one of the things like if so if you have an actual investors and you're doing audited financial statements, um, you're required to do accrual basis under gap, and you're also required to disclose in the notes to your financial statements exactly what accounting methodologies you're using. Like how am I valuing my inventory? Um, you're also supposed to put like accounts receivable, aging, and um, accounts payable. You don't always see accounts payable aging, but a lot of times there'll be accounts receivable aging if accounts receivable are a significant portion of your assets. Um, so yeah, so you actually have to provide clarity to your investors as to what your policies are and so that they can properly understand what's being presented in your financial statements. And that's why part of why we have GAAP 
So accrual is gap, generally accepted accounting principles. Cash basis is not actually gap. So anybody who's required to present gap financials to anybody would have to do accrual, basically. So um, any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Okay. So which of these is not an advantage of accrual-based accounting? Yeah, it doesn't really highlight the um, cash effects of your operations that much. So um, that would be more cash basis. All right, so on Monday, I handed out um, a handout to everybody uh, that was the House of Gap. So you can have that and take notes on it if you want. Um, hopefully everybody still has those. Is, did anybody here not get one of those? If so, I can give you one of my office after, but I don't have, I forgot to bring spares with me. But when we talk about uh, generally accepted accounting principles, this is called the House of Gap. And they've been presenting this to accounting students for decades and decades. But basically this reflects what level of authority different um, types of uh, uh, accounting literature have over how you should be doing your financial reporting. And they have most authoritative at the bottom, least authoritative at the top. For me, that seems sort of like counterintuitive, but whatever. That's why it's labeled anyway, so if you forget. But so uh, the ones at the bottom tend to be like the oldest ones that were made up. And then as you go further upwards in this house, this is all the stuff that has been uh, developed over time when people came back and were like, well, what about this? What about this? How do we interpret this? Um, so as people became more nitpicky and trying to find ways around all the things, um, the FASB and the International Accounting Standards Board has been playing whack-a-mole and like stopping all that stuff down through various types of pronouncements and whatnot. And so at the bottom, the original like old school pronouncements were the um, were written by the AICPA in their accounting research bulletins. And then um, the accounting principles board was another um, old school organization that predated the FASB um, on all this technical stuff. And then the FASB is the most, the Financial Accounting Standards Board is the most recent and still in existence organization that kind of oversees all this. So their standards and interpretations are like big, the big rules as far as it is concerned. And so, um, the next level up you see like, so FASB technical bulletins, they're like, well, what about in this industry? If we take this rule, how does this get applied in this particular industry and situation, like broad type situations? So they come out with a technical bulletin to be like, all right, we made a rule, here's how you can use it. Um, and then the AICPA statement of position were kind of the same, um, essentially the same concept, but for those way back accounting research bulletins. So these don't typically, the AICPA statements of position, um, you don't see as many of those coming out anymore unless the FASB is ne neglecting something and then they've made a rule and the AICPA comes out as a group. That's the um, um, American Institute of Certified Public, of, uh, Certified Public Accountants. So kind of the professional licensing and stand, uh, board of um, CPAs. So sometimes they'll come in as a group and be like, this is the way we think that this should be interpreted because they tend to act a little faster than the FFB if something comes up where people are just like, what is going on here? And then the AICPA industry audit and accounting guides are kind of like a combination between the technical bulletins um, that provide a little more like step-by-step -step implementation instruction. Now up here on this level, we've got the FASB's Emerging Issues Task Force. So they have a group of a subgroup of the FASB whose entire job is to look at stuff that we didn't have any type of rule for previously, like there wasn't even a um, precedent set. So like probably one um, 
big thing for that would be like cryptocurrencies and accounting for crypto type stuff. Um, that's probably the single biggest um, emerging issue, I would say, in the last five to 10 years that they've been dealing with as a task force, because here we have like a totally new kind of currency, which doesn't lend itself to being recorded necessarily in traditional accounting terms. So how do we quantify that? How do we deal with that as accountants and whatnot? And then um, the AICPA accounting standards, executive committee practice bulletins, um, those are kind of like smaller group statements of position. Again, they tend to be more um, transient in nature, things that come up uh, quickly and have not yet been addressed by the Emerging Issues tax Task Force. What you might end up seeing is that some of the AICPA positions on it, they'll develop their positions and kind of steer that towards the FASB as they make something more official. Um, so this is like, um, I would say FASB tends to be slightly, if you're between the two of these and one of these conflicted, the FASB would be the one that would kind of overcome between the two. And then up here, um, these are like, um, we've got something new that we've addressed and we've given you rules on it. And then in individual interpretations. So my, so one company that has a specialized type of situation in their industry will come in and say, well, we feel like this might be an exception to this. Can we get a, a an interpretation on this? Um, and they would, that would potentially be sort of like, you see that with the IRS too, like IRS interpretations on things. So this would be like, okay, we've got something that isn't big enough to benefit its own rule, but we feel like there's a, a genuine exception that should be noted. That's where that would kind of come in. Um, the implementation guides, um, same kind of thing. And then um, industry practices, like everybody's doing this and everybody's been doing this for a long time is in general, um, it's a least authoritative, authoritative form of gap. So, um, I, I can think of like one really good example of that is um, LIFO inventory, which technically can be used under GAP. It's used heavily in certain uh, industries like car sales and things like that because it provides lots of tax benefits. But the US is the, is the only country that allows LIFO. Like other countries are like, well, that doesn't make sense. Um, to, to use like the most recent um, purchases as your uh, valuation. And it causes all kinds of problems, which we'll talk about more in our inventory thing. But So that's the House of Gap. If you ever do a Master of Accountancy, you'll get to do a class where you like rip that apart um, up and down and sideways, which is more interesting actually than I would have ever anticipated. Knowing the history behind it is kind of, is actually, um, I would not have anticipated enjoying that class at all, but I did. Okay, so um, as far as like overall standard setting organizations, anything that is legislated by Congress is going to be at the top of that heap, right? Um, as far as if they're making accounting rule, uh, rules and whatnot. Uh, an example of that would be the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which, um, came in and like put the hammer down on public accounting as far as like how firms could operate, what types of uh, different services you could provide um, alongside of an audit to make sure that financial statement auditors are truly independent of the organizations that they're um, auditing. And the reason that that came apart, uh, came about was because in like 2000, 2001, there was a huge set of financial scandals. There were multiple companies that were doing some sketchy stuff. And the common thread between all of these companies when they went under and took a whole bunch of investors money with them was that their auditors had a lot of money that they were being paid to do other services not related to the audit. So they were not truly independent and were not obviously not um, exercising what is called professional skepticism in their audits um, and taking that step back and being like, really, is this okay? Because they'd have consultants that would come in and get paid by a company a boatload of money to come up with some financial workaround um, with respect to 
recording liabilities and whatever. And one of those things that they did was they're like, well, instead of having all your liabilities in your company on your balance sheet, start another company and then borrow the money into that company. So that company has the loans and then that company invests the money into the main company. So it increases your capital, your equity in the accounting equation instead of increasing your liabilities, makes your numbers look better. Everyone thinks your profit looks awesome and everybody has a party, right? Well, the party got shut down by the police <laughs> and the company all went out of the business. So that was bad news for a lot of people. So Congress can come in at any point if they think that these people at the bottom in the private sector are not uh, doing what they need to do. They can step in and make a law that will just um, trump everything that everybody else is doing. Now, the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, is an organization that was created through um, the Securities Acts of 1933 and 1934, um, specifically to oversee how um, public offerings of stock are made to the public. Because people were starting to um, invest more in companies. There was, um, this has become less of a um, household remembrance now because of some financial scandals like in the last 20 years, but um, there was a huge massive stock market crash that wiped out large, like completely financially wiped out a number of major investment holders um, and business owners in the United States in the 1930s. And so, uh, or was it 29? I don't remember the exact year, but um, as a result of that, the SEC was formed to be like, all right, we've got to have some rules as to how these companies are reporting their income. Because before that, they could kind of just make up anything and they could sell shares of anything to whoever they wanted without any kind of regulation. So that's why that came about. Below them would be the private sector. So thinking like banks, organizations like the FASB, the uh, Accounting Principles Board, and the, oh my gosh, accounting, something of accounting committee on accounting principles, maybe. I have to double check that one. I haven't pulled that one up for a while. Um, <clears throat> So they would all be considered private sector organizations that are serving a regulatory role with the permission of Congress and the SEC. Okay. Oh, 29. I was close. 1929. So um, one thing you will want to know for a couple different classes, uh, this class and auditing both uh, will have mention of those 1933 and 1934 Securities Acts. Um, the 33 Act relates to initial public offerings of stock. So when a company is first deciding to publicly sell their shares of stock out into the market, that's an IPO. So they've never sold them publicly before. That would be governed under the 1933 Act. And then the 1934 Act applies to how everything gets done after they're already actively trading out onto the market. So things like um, um, reporting requirements, financial statement reporting requirements and whatnot. So that's sort of the big dividing line before or after the IPO. Oh, Committee on Accounting Procedure. I was two thirds, right? I had the P wrong. Um, I've already kind of gone through these, but um, the Committee on Accounting Procedure was sort of the precursor to the AICPA, which is the professional licensing organization of public accounting. And so the reason why, um, or I, I'm, yeah. So they became the Committee of the American Institute of Accountants and later the AICPA. The AICPA one is kind of the bigger one to know um, as far as what's out there now, being familiar with what they do. Um, if anybody decides to go on to the CPA exam later on, the AICPA basically like, um, they don't actually make the rules on the CPA exam. Those are made by state governments at, on a state by state basis. 
but they try to be the rule setters for that. And they try to bring all of the states together to make a decision together, which is really interesting because um, they were sort of in charge of the whole drive to come up with the 150 credit rule for CPA licensure and um, heavily supported the research that showed, oh, it doesn't affect the number of people who are going into public accounting. And then now they are the ones dragging their feet while the state governments are all saying, hey, we need a lot more CPAs. Like we have a shortage of CPAs right now. Um, and we would like to do away with the 150 credit rule or at least make it so that people can, um, you know, substitute uh, experience years for a certain number of credits to make it easier for people to get licensed. So Minnesota is actually one of the states that's kind of leading the charge on that. Um, and the AICPA was like, we don't see a problem. Everything's fine. It's like that meme with the guy who's sitting at the table drinking coffee and like the room is on fire around him, like the little dog guy. Like, it's fine. <laughs> That's kind of the AICPA right now as far as the CPA pipeline issue is concerned. Like, it's a problem, but we're drinking our coffee. Um, so, in um, but one of the downsides there is that like they want... CPAs to be fully portable. There's a lot of firms where you can work where you might be housed in Minnesota or licensed in Minnesota, but be working in a whole bunch of areas, other physical geographical areas in the country. So you want to have your licensure be transferable. Um, and most states have not yet gotten to the um, legislative or uh, rulemaking side of changing that 150 credit rule yet. But I sort of feel like it's going that way possibly even by the time many of you would end up um, seeking licensure if you decide to go into public accounting, so. What would have changed it? <clears throat> um, I think what they did was uh, like, I mean, it used to just be a four-year accounting degree and then you had to have a certain number of courses in, you had to have intermediate accounting, you had to have a tax course, you had to have an auditing course. Um, and then you had to have so many credits of business courses, but a typical four year 128 credit degree would in, in accounting would get you all of those um, necessary courses and credits in order to be licensed. So it basically like cut out an additional 22 credits. And, and one of the things that people have, like the reason they argued for the 150 credits was like, oh, it'll encourage people to get more training in other areas that would be applicable, but they didn't put that into the rule. They actually put into the rule that it could be any college credits. So you could go out and take underwater basket weaving and it would count towards your 150 credits, which doesn't seem like a great value proposition, you know, to argue to students. So if you, on the other hand, do like a finance major on top of it or a CIS minor or a data analytics minor, Arguably, you are increasing your marketability as an employee and, and also giving yourself new skills that can be highly transferable across a number of businesses. So as a student, that does benefit you. What they did not anticipate, however, was or really think about, they're like, yay, think of how much more uh, skill level the accountants will have if they take another 22 credits. Well, that's great, but everybody else is happy they have those skills too. So they're willing to offer more money to those people uh, with fewer hours. So um, it's always been a little bit the case in public accounting where you would uh, go in and take a, uh, a certain number of people would just go in and work in public accounting for a couple of years with the plan of exiting and going out to different types of either finance careers or entrepreneurship or whatever, but it's kind of accelerated that exit to where people are, are a lot of times doing fewer than three years and then they're getting huge offers from other uh, companies because corporate finance realizes much more quickly when there's a shortage and it's more quickly willing to bump up their pay and stuff to continue their own pipeline of accountants faster than public accounting is. So, so it's been interesting to watch that. Evolve. Did you get your CPA? I did, yeah. So I went, I did get my CPA. Um, I do think it, so getting your CPA is a 
very mixed bag if you're going ultimately into corporate because on the one hand it's a huge bump up and it shows that you have a level of um, commitment and self-regulation to study for and pass the exam which is valuable to external employers but then once you go outside of um, public accounting not a lot of employers are willing to continue paying for your CPE and your licensure so you know it can feel like oh why did I do this but the reality is a lot of the people who are hiring you out of public and into corporate finance and corporate accounting are people who used to be CPAs themselves. So they do recognize that. And it gives you the ability to jump out at like a controller level or a manager level from public as opposed to going into a staff accounting level, um, which means a significant difference in pay when you exit too. So, so there is value to um, doing it. And where you go will vastly determine um, whether you need it or not. Um, there's also plenty of people who go and work in public accounting for like four or five years, never bother to get licensed, get like really good experience and then go out without their CPA. But because they had the years in public, they still got a lot of that kind of street cred for it. So, yeah. So what, what percentage of accountants have done some public accounting before going into corporate? Boy, that's a tough one. Um, I would be willing to pull. Well, let me think. Let's, it depends on the roles you're going into. Because if you if it's just like a, uh, uh, um, if you're looking at analyst or above, I would say it's got to be like eighty or ninety percent. Um, because in order to have the transferable skills for a lot of things, um, getting that experience in a lot of companies is worth it. Even if you just get a couple of years of, ex of public accounting experience, you get you get that. Um, if you're looking at a staff accountant or a technician role, um, the percentage would go down. I bet it is below half because most people who go out of public can bypass those. If that makes sense, yeah. So when you get your CPA, you have to keep it. Yeah, I mean, it's like $100 a year. And then CPE, um, you're supposed to do uh, on an average of 40 hours of continuing professional education a year. Um, that's actually more expensive than the licensure, but you can do online like self-study stuff. That's a couple hundred bucks. So it's not super expensive. If you work for a public accounting firm, they pay for all that for you. Like it's standard. If you don't go to a, if a public accounting firm won't pay for your CPE, go somewhere else because, I mean, there's going to be other stuff that they also are nickel and diming you on. Like I, it's super unusual for a public accounting firm to not pay for that. And a lot of, um, if you, if you make arguments about like taking certain types of classes that relate to your actual job duties, you can get some of your, um, private companies to pay for it too. You just have to be a little more creative because they won't be like, oh, it's mandatory. Here's your CPE and your licensure and stuff. Yeah. Will they pay for the like CPA exam itself? So um, most public accounting firms will reimburse you for it. So like once you pay for it and, and a lot of them will buy you your study materials too. Not all of them, but most of them will. Because it's to their benefit for you to get licensed. Yeah. So like... Uh, to take the CPA exam, you need 2,000 hours of experience. So if you're working at a firm already, then they would pay for your your test. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, that's uh, um, I mean, it varies from firm to firm, but yeah, they would reimburse you for the cost of the exam. Most of them do reimbursement because they don't want to just keep shelling out money to you without verification you're actually taking and passing sections of the exam. Um, but yeah, the materials they'll usually pay for upfront, study materials. And most firms will have a policy like, this is the one we buy for everybody. And then they'll just, you just say, hey, I want this, and then they'll get it for you. Um, but yeah, 2,000 hours is like one year. Yeah, yeah a full time experience. So. And so does it have to be, it can't be intense from experience as full time? Um, it can count. You just got to be careful, like when you do that, that you get a written, because you have to supply written documentation that you have the hours. So like if you're working, if you're getting an internship um, from someone, so uh, the rules for the hours of that has to be under a CPA. 
a supervising CPA. Right. And it used to be that you had to do it at a public accounting firm. Um, they did manage to successfully argue, um, I believe this is nationally, I know for sure it's in Minnesota, that you can have that experience be under a CPA who is working in corporate. So if somebody's licensed in corporate and they're training you, you can get them to sign your experience for you. So you don't have to technically be in public accounting. Yeah. Do they have to be active? I think so. Somebody does. There's usually one floating around somewhere. There's always people, and and especially like in tax or whatever. There's a there's people who kind of bounce back and forth between public firms and working in like corporate tax positions. Um, so there's usually somebody out there who's a CPA still that you can figure that out with if you need to. Um, it's worth checking though. Like if you want to get licensed and you want to work somewhere. Um, then you know be like okay is there somebody here who's a cpa who's an active licensed cpa who can sign off on my experience requirements too <laughs> so let's see what we got here we go we started at we got till two okay yeah all right so i'm gonna keep moving if you come up with more questions this will be some uh accounting careers will keep coming up but yeah and how long is the exam um, so it's four sections of the exam and they're each like about four hours long. So, and then you can, huh? Well, it used to be that you'd sit down and or they'd park you in an auditorium for two days and make you do it for eight hours a day for two days. Um, now they actually let you break it up into four sections and take one section at a time. Um, and you can like spread them out over a year if you want to which is nice, but they've also like sort of taken advantage of that by being like, hey, now we can be more in depth because people don't have to pull all of this, you know, out of their heads with, you know, for four things at a time. So um, one thing about the scoring is it's relative. It is not um, an absolute score. So when they say you have to get a 75 to pass the exam, it's not a 75%. It is a measurement of um, acceptability that they look at. So um, I don't know exactly how they determine that. Obviously the vast majority of it is, did you get the stuff correct or not? But then they also throw some stuff out um, and whatnot and look at like, oh, if everybody got this one wrong, let me throw that one out. And then there's also a portion of the exam, which will, which are always like test questions that don't even count towards your score. So they're vetting and testing the, um, predictive ability of, of like one in 10 questions to use in future exams. Um, yeah. So do you like, like fill in the blank or like, what is it? Huh? Is it are they all like essay questions? No, there's a variety. There's, so there's, um, there's usually like three sections or a couple sections of multiple choice. And then there will be some like research type questions where you need to be able to go into like a, IRS, so on tax, like go into the IRS regulations, like a fake IRS database and then find citations to support a position and then write something up and then put the citation in there. Um, there's also simulations where they'll be like, you know, complete this financial statement using the following presented trial balance or whatever type of thing. So you have to know, okay, which ones are current assets, liabilities, sort it out and make a, so it's not unlike actually homework that you do in intermediate. Like these questions we do in this class are probably like 95% of what you'll see on the um, financial section of the CPA exam in intermediate one and intermediate two, with the exception of some nonprofit governmental and like super simple consolidation type stuff that gets covered in advance. So yeah. Did you pass everything on your first attempt? No, I did not. And most people do not. <laughs> but when I did pass, I got really good scores. Uh, for me, the issue was like really um, discipline. I just like, so the first time I took financial, I got through all the chapters of my study materials other than the nonprofit and governmental one. And uh, and I sort of like spent like, you know, 20 minutes skimming that chapter and I got like a whole simulation on it and I got a 74. So I was like, always, so, the, so my takeaway from there is always, always get through all of the material because that will be the one you'll get a major thing on it and won't pass. Um, but I actually got like a, a 94 or 92 on audit, which anything above the below 80s is kind of insane. 
And I kind of like telling this story, so I'm going to waste time and tell it anyway. <laughs> so I got to the end of tax season, and I thought I had, um, like, a month and a half left on my notice to schedule. Because when you purchase your sections for the exam, they give you a certain amount of time to use them up. And I thought I had like six weeks to study for the audit section. And I went to, I'm like, well, I better schedule it because you always want to do it well in advance. There's a limited number of seats in Duluth and stuff. So I pulled it up and I had like nine days <laughs> before it expired. And so the only place I could get a place, a spot to take the exam was like down in Edina at a Prometric station down there. So I booked it on the very last day I could. And then I immediately like went to my boss and was like, I'm taking all of the time between now and then off to study for the exam. And it was after tax season. So they're like, good, use your vacation time, knock yourself out. So I, um, at the time I had like the audio um, recordings. For, so I had the Glide system, which had like audio things that you could listen to. And I had like multiple choice study stuff. And then I had books. And so I basically like ripped through the whole thing. I would listen to the standard audit report for the uh, financial statements and the audit standards on repeat while I was driving everywhere for like 10 days. And, and I made up acronyms for everything, like all of the field work standards, um, what went into the standard audit report, all the departures from the audit report, just made up all these acronyms. Um, and basically just like rote memorization. And that's the one exam where rote memorization really does benefit you. And then when I got in there, I wrote it, you, your clock starts and you have so many minutes to log into the system and start the exam. Um, so I logged in, my clock started, I had like 10 minutes to enter the exam and I pulled out my note paper and I wrote down every acronym that I could on my piece of paper so I wouldn't panic later. And then I took the exam came out of the exam, cried because I was like, I failed. This was miserably hard. It was terrible. And I spent like a month being like super depressed and bummed being like, I'm going to study all that stuff again. And then I got my score and it was like in the nineties and I was like, oh, <laughs> so you can do it. Financial, forget about it. Can't do it for financial. Can't do that for tax. Um, and then they're kind of switching. They're no longer doing the business environment and concepts one. They're um, they're doing like a discipline track starting in 2024, which will be like more advanced levels of stuff. So that one's sort of a big question mark at this point, how that's going to shake out. But yeah. I still have my score uh, result letters in a pile somewhere in my office at home. Because you get, it's, you spend a year of your life like busting your butt doing something, you kind of get a little emotionally attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. After you failed it, did you have to like wait a certain amount of time before you take it? You can just take it. A, so they have scheduling windows, um, like three months out of the year, um, and you can take it in the next window. So you can take it like ninety days later. So like, there was like no delay. So. I mean, not really. I mean, yeah. So like, if you took it in February, you'd have to wait until. April to take it again, but nope, no, you could take it every quarter and continually fail it for the rest of your life if you wanted to. <laughs> Don't recommend that. That would be expensive. How much is it? Um, I don't know exactly what it is now. It was a couple hundred bucks, I think, a section. So I know you guys are now. You guys are just like abusing my question answering. So I'm gonna. I'm going to put the kibosh on it and start going. Okay. Yeah, because we're only on slide 22 out of like 65. Okay. So, so I got to get to at least like 30 or 40 here. All right. So the FASB accounting standards, all of the rules that they set for accounting, um, they code them numerically. And so um, you can actually go out to the FASB web, uh, website and look up things um, based on topic and based on numeric code. And then if you were to cite these on an exam, um, you would pull the code off of the FASB website. So you will have a, a homework problem in, and I don't remember if it was this chapter or if it's a different chapter off the top of my head right now, but you can go out here to the um, accounting standards codification on the FASB website. And then you can um, look up whatever uh, pronouncement you want. And so the cool thing about this, 
is that like you can actually they pull they do have a codification like this in the financial section that you probably you have a good chance of getting a um um simulation on in the financial section but you can look up like oh if i want to know how to do something you can go up here topically and then just sort of like winnow down to exactly what subtopic you want to look at you can also look something up by number. So if somebody gives you a FASB codification and they're like, what is this about? You can put it in here into the search and just pull it right up and not have to like um, search your way through it. And I think I might have a, a in-class exercise on that one too, but. So these are the general numerical topics on here. I mean, I'm, don't don't memorize this by any means, but if you want to go look something up, um, honestly, it'd be easier to just go to the fasb.org website and then click through those codifications and find it rather than using this slide. Um, as far as international accounting standards, those are set by um, the International Accounting Standards Board. And so, um, for about 20 years or so, a little more now, probably 25 years maybe, they've been um, trying to unify everybody under a single system of accounting. Um, Americans always uh, have examples of things they don't want to do. So they've been trying to, um, the revenues, standardizing revenues, you wouldn't think that that would take like 18 years or something or 20 years but it definitely did like they finally they finally standardized that in like the mid 2010s so like somewhere around 2015 and then lease accounting standards were finalized finalized around the same time but implementation they gave like a four-year window or something so like they'll come up with the idea and say this is what we're going to do but then it'll be four years later before they require everybody to do it that way so those are some big um examples of convergence they call it yeah do accountants just love acronyms because i've never seen this many acronyms i don't think anybody loves acronyms but we have like so much stuff and they all get like mixed up and if you're talking about something repetitively over and over again like FASB is way easier and faster to say than the financial accounting standards for this the financial accounting standards for that and the international accounting standards for this and whatever um IFERS is uh is one that was like over and over and over again. If you hear anybody say IFERS, just slap them. That's not right. It's not okay. Um, has to be IFERS. I'm just kidding. Don't actually slap anyone. But there are some weird, like every once in a while, you'll run into like the one out of 20 people who will be like talking about IFERS and you'll see everybody in the, everybody in the room that's an accountant look at each other and be like, you know, I don't know who comes up with that, but. IFERS. All right, so this just sort of like goes through US GAAP versus IFERS um, and what, what different organizations set up all the history here. I'm not gonna like walk through all of this. It's tedious. It's worth knowing that um, what the boards are. Like I would say the House of GAAP is, is really the big thing you need to know. Don't bother learning any of the history of IFERS because I would be shocked if anybody ever cared about that enough to even ask you a question. They want you to know that IFERS is a thing and that convergence between the FASB and um, the IASB is a thing um, and that IFERS and GAP have slight differences but are gradually converging over time. Um, and they will want you to know if there are key areas where they diverge probably um, that would be a bigger question they're like where do the where are the two different which is constantly changing so that will be something that you'll kind of study at the time when that comes through it used to be like lease accounting was the big difference and now it isn't anymore so okay so more and more countries are are using ifers it used to be that like germany had their own the uk had their own ireland had their own china had their own and now for the most part, if you have a company that is operating in many countries, they will almost certainly be creating their financial statements under IFRS. And then if they're in the US also, especially if they're publicly traded, 
then they will probably have like a translated set of financial statements into um, US GAAP. But the vast majority of them, because it's expensive to try and figure out what's different between the two, we'll just go with IFRS instead, because there's not really anything other than some like terminology, like how they refer to things that's different between, between IFRS. Most of GAAP, you can go with IFRS or another alternative that's also allowable under GAAP for the most part. One of the key differences, though, uh, between those is that um, international accounting standards are based are very much principles based. So they depend on you being like, OK, what is right in principle as far as like revenue? Like if I say it's revenue and you know it's revenue, you can't come in here and argue some stupid loophole that we forgot to put a piece of tape on and argue that it's not revenue under IFRS because they're principles based. That's probably the single biggest difference between US GAAP, because under US GAAP and US law in general, we tend to be rules based. So if you can come up with an exception where something's an exception to the rule and you can be like, eh, it's an exception to the rule and I can do whatever I want. And um, and that's, that's a, a fundamental difference between our legal system and most many other countries um, legal systems like the UK and Europe and stuff. So perfect convergence will probably never happen just because we're America and we do things our own way. Individualism is like a, is a uh, social value that's very different here from a lot of other first world countries. Okay, um, so how do they set these processes? Uh, I'm not gonna go through this right now because we have like two minutes left, right? So we'll just wrap up on this. Um, let me, hold on a second here. Just skimming through here on reform. I already talked about socks a little bit. So we'll probably dive, please skim through some of that FASB stuff in your text or in like the like um, standard setting. And we're gonna jump in on conceptual framework and then try to wrap up chapter one with that on Friday because this is all realistically way more important than that. So, yeah. Uh, the only thing Discussion. Oh, uh, is that for uh, chapter two? It says chapter one. Oh yeah. Uh, so try to go through and answer those. Is that is that what it says you today? Yeah. Yeah. So go through and just um, try to do those that terminology stuff in there um, for today. Thanks. And then we'll probably do the the pre reading. I think for chapter two isn't due till Wednesday. So. <laughs> I found myself being short.